You want first place, come play with me. You want second place, go somewhere else. I had a purpose. I wanted to be one of the best basketball players to ever play. And anything else that was outside of that lane, I didn't have time for. I made that deal with myself at 13 years old. Like, I, I would watch Magic play, I'd watch Michael play, and I would see them do these unbelievable things, and I'd say, you know, can I get to that level? I don't know, but let's find out. Let's find out. And so that curiosity to see where I could push this thing led me down that path, I think. Do you think one of the edge you had over everybody else was the biggest percentage of your focus was on one thing? Mm -hmm. Do you see it that way? Like, that was my edge over everybody else. I, I do. Um, at the time, I didn't really understand that, right? So, you know, basketball for me was the most important thing. So everything I saw, whether it was TV shows, whether it was books I read, people I talked to, everything was done to try to learn how to become a better basketball player. Everything, everything. And so when you have that point of view, then literally the world becomes your library to help you to become better at your craft. So at 13 years old, I had a, um, <laughs> I had a kill list. And so, you know, they used to do these rankings. It was Street and Smith basketball rankings. And I was nowhere to be found because I was like 6'4", scrawny, like 160 pounds soaking wet. So I was like 57 on the list. And so I will look at 56, 55, all the way up to number one, who these players are, what club teams they played for. So when we go on an AAU travel circuit, I, I got to hunt them down, right? And so that became my mission in high school, is to check off every other person, all those 56 other names, hunt them down and knock them down. At 13 years old, you know, I played the longer game because my game wasn't about being better than you at 13. It was to be better than you when, you know, the chips are really on, on the line. So when you played at 13, I would size you up and see what your strengths and weaknesses are. How do you approach the game? Are you silly about it? Are you goofy about it? Are you good at it just because you're bigger and stronger than everybody else, right? Or is there actually thought and skill that you put into it, right? And when I'd play, I'd play to my weaknesses. I wouldn't play to my strengths, I played to my weaknesses. Because when you're playing summer basketball, there's so many games. So there's not a lot of skill work being done. So when are you gonna get better, right? When you're playing in competition situations, you're only playing to your strengths, why? Because you wanna win, right? So what I would do, I was work on the things during those games that I was weak at. Left hand, pull up jump shot, uh, post game, right? So I have a strategy. And so then fast forward to when I'm 17, and my game is completely well-rounded, and that player at 13 that I saw at 13 is still doing the same shit at 17, now you got a problem. But you know, in the NBA, <clears throat> it was actually easier because what I found in the NBA is a lot of guys played for financial stability. And when they came to the NBA, they got that financial stability, so therefore the passion and the work ethic and the, obsession, and the obsessiveness was gone. So I'm looking at that, I'm like, Oh my God, it's gonna be like taking candy from a baby. Now, I wonder Mike wins all these fucking championships. <laughs> this is crazy. You know what I'm saying? Of and, 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 like, and, and then you had the players that had that passion, but weren't willing to commit their entire lives to doing that, right? It's a choice. Like, I see a lot of players take vacations with other players that are close friends and I'll oh, just take vacations just to take vacations or just hang out just to hang out like I never did that why, why, not, why, why, why didn't you do that what, well because when I retire I didn't want to have to say I wish I would have done more I don't want that but at the time I deal with what I've referred to as Goat Mountain I went to Goat Mountain and I talked to Magic Michael, Bird, Kim Olajuwon, Jerry West, Oscar Robinson, Bill Russell, you know. So I would talk to them. What did you do? 
What were your experiences? Michael in particular, he's become my big brother. He's been my big brother since I first came in the league. And what was that process like? So I went to them and started understanding the ins and outs of the game and you know how they approach things and their level of detail and obsessiveness. And, um, and that's what I did. I tell you, like when we, when I was in high school, um, and uh, I used to work out with the 76ers. I used to ask them, you know, what's it like to guard Mike? You know, Mike? You mean Black Jesus? I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> black who? Or oh, we call him Black Jesus, or you can call him Black Cat. I'm like, I'm gonna call him fucking Mike. That's his fucking name. So the level of fear that he inspired in others was insane wow. and I would tell him I said when I face him we're gonna go at it he says oh you don't want to do that I'm like what man you don't know me man and so when we matched up I think he understood that and you know when I was 18 my first year he got the best of me a bunch of times I was right there the next play you're not intimidating me yeah. I'm not going anywhere and I think he saw that level of respect because I think he was the same way at 18 years old and that common bond is what I think, uh, you know, where our connection was built. It's the last game of the season you play Utah. Yeah. The one where you shoot three air balls at the end. Five, it was like five. And then you hit one and his them doesn't go in, right? Mm -hmm. Shaq was whispering something in your ear. What did Shaq say to you in that moment? I don't even know. You don't remember? No, I wasn't paying attention. Got you know, like, like it, it was, you know, like for me, it, it's, Maybe it's a little like asshole of me or whatever, but whatever. Um, he was like, he was trying to whisper encouraging things. I was like, I'm fucking fine. Okay, I, I shot five air balls on national TV in front of millions of people that cost us a series and I'm 18, I'm fine, dude. How did you get mentally and emotionally so strong where it doesn't bother you. Well, you know, it's, you gotta look at the reality of the situation. You kinda gotta get over yourself. Like, it's not about you, man. Like, oh, okay, you feel embarrassed. You're not that important. Like, <laughs> get over yourself. Yeah, that's where you go. Get over yourself, right? Like, you're worried about how people may perceive you and like you're walking around and it's embarrassing because you shot five air balls. Get over yourself, right? And then after that, it's okay, well, why did those air balls happen? got it I didn't have the legs so you look at the shot every shot was online every shot was online but every shot was short right I got to get stronger got I got to train differently the weight training program that I'm doing I got to tailor it for an 82 game season mm. so that when the playoffs come around my legs are stronger and that ball gets there so I look at it with rationale Say, okay, well, the reason why I shot air balls is because my legs aren't there. I got well, next year they'll be there. That was it. Done. Done. I mean, you hear so many guys tell stories about your work ethic. Yeah. What was really your work ethic like, and for how long did you stay disciplined? Um, well, I mean, I mean, every day. I mean, since you know, 20 years. I mean, it was an everyday process and trying to figure out strengths and weaknesses. For example, jumping ability. Man, my vertical was a 40. It wasn't a 46 or a 40, 45. Um, my hands are big, but they're not massive. Right? So you got to figure out ways to strengthen them so your hands are strong enough to be able to palm a ball and do the things that you need to do. Uh, quickness. I was quick, but not insanely quick. I was fast, but not ridiculously fast. Right? So I had to rely on skill a lot more. I had to rely on angles a lot more. I had to study the game a lot more. And, uh, but I enjoyed it though. So like from the time I was, I can remember when I started watching the game, I studied the game mm. and it just never changed. Who would Shaq be if he had your work ethic? He'd be the greatest of all time, for sure. I mean, this guy was a, a force, like I have never seen. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah, I wish he was in the gym. I would have had fucking 12 rings. Listen, I don't, I don't deal with people that don't commit at that level, but then act as if they do. I don't deal with that. I don't. Right? So a lot of our contention 
came from that. And even though he was older, you were still f confronting him. You didn't, you didn't care. Oh, about I didn't care. Fun. Man, from listen. Day one, bro, from day one? From day one. I, I knew for sure Rick Fox, my teammates, they all thought I was absolutely crazy the day me and Shaq got in the fist fight. After that day, they were like, okay, Kobe, you're certifiable. Uh, <laughs> fist fight. Oh, yeah. Fist fight. Oh, I'm not backing down. Listen, either you're going to whoop my ass or I'm a, we're going to have a night. But, you know, <laughs> ain't no way. You know, it's, it, there's a there's a level of respect, and, and for Shaq too, by the way. And that, I know he he's told me that that day was a big turning point for him because it was like you know he's generally used to talking trash and saying what he wants, and nobody really stepping up and challenging him on that. And when he saw me challenge him on that, he was like, "This kid's crazy." All right, I can win with that, you know, and so that. It's kind of the beginning of our relationship, I think. You know, sometimes uh, 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 we are so worried about what other people think about us. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, what if they think I'm crazy? What if they think I'm over obsessive or competitive? And what if this is like, you're too much. This is just not healthy for you to be thinking this way, right? Yeah. How did you get your mindset into this alter ego to be comfortable being Black Mamba, like how, how did that happen? It's a good separation for me, you know, emotionally to be able to put myself in a place where at practice or when I'm training or during games, I switch my mind to something else. I switch my mode into something else, right? For me, it's the equivalent of Maximus, Desmus, Meridius, and Gladiator picking up the dirt, smelling the dirt, it's go time. So that was my mental switch. It was like an actor getting ready for a film. You gotta put yourself in that cage. When you're in that cage, you are that character. And then when you leave there, it's something completely different. When I'm in that cage, bro, don't fucking touch me. Don't talk to me. Just <laughs> leave me alone. I, there used to be certain games, like, for like certain key games. Uh, I don't think I've ever said this before. This, is, this kind of makes me seem very psychotic, but whatever. I used to uh, play the Halloween theme song over and over and over in my headphones. Pre-game. Seriously. 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 And it was important that it was Michael Myers because the mask itself was void of emotion. Void of emotion. It has That's nothing to do with pressure, has level. nothing to do with hype, has nothing to do with camaraderie, it's stone cold killer. And I would listen to that song over and over and over wow. again. That's, that's when you know you better run. Cause <laughs> that's what a lot of people did. Yeah, it's probably <laughs> coming out. You know, it's going to be a tough night. Story. Yeah. It's your last game. You're playing Utah. Yeah. And uh, I'm standing up the entire time. I'm getting the last four minutes, which is the best freaking four minutes. <laughs> and I see you, Shaq, saying, go for 50. And then you, you're just going. And, and you're not hitting easy shots. These are not easy shots. You hit your last shot. You scored six. Guys, nobody has ever had a 60-point game to retire with. Like, <laughs> that has never happened. Like, it's insane <laughs> for this to happen. You hit your 60 point. Seeing this guy, he's so freaking determined to say, I came and gave everything I had, and I'm going to give it to the last freaking second. That's what you did. But then you leave, and you're like, no, it's good. I'm cool. During that year, everybody kept coming up to me and saying, okay, you're going to have stages of grief when you retire. You're going to go into a state of depression when you retire. And those are all normal and all this other stuff. And I'm like, dude, I'm fine. Yes, of course you would say that. I said that too. I'm like, dude, fuck, man. And so after a while, I just started listening like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, and then my competitive, competitiveness inside was like, no, I'm going to do something in the next 20 years that is better than these last 20. You might not understand that. I'm doing that, <laughs> you know? You know? So the competitiveness kicks in.